Hello, everyone. Welcome to this exciting book launch event with Hamid Dabashi and Adaf Zawaif. Uh, we're so honored to have them with us today for this Haymarket Books live stream. Uh, the book that we are launching today on Edward Said, Remembrance of Things Past, uh, is really a, a tremendous achievement. We're so honored to be publishers of this critical volume. Uh, we really hope people will uh, get the book. There'll be information in the chat on how to do so, uh, and also other works by both of our distinguished authors uh, and the participants in this conversation today. Hamid Dabashi is an internationally renowned cultural critic and award-winning author. He's written more than 25 books, edited four, and contributed chapters to many others. Among them are Authority in Islam, Truth and Narrative, Close Up, Iranian Cinema, Past, Present, Future, Staging a Revolution, Iran, A People Interrupted, and Dreams of a Nation on Palestinian Cinema. He is Hagop Kevorkian Professor of Iranian Studies and Comparative Literature at Columbia University and lives in New York City. Adaf Suwaif is an Egyptian short story writer, novelist, and political and cultural commentator. Her latest book is a memoir of the Egyptian revolution of 2011, Cairo, A City Transformed. She's the author of Map of Love, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize for fiction in 1999, and is the founding chair of the Palestine Festival of Literature, PalFest. She lives in London and Cairo and joins us today from Cairo. Uh, I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over uh, to Adaf and um, Hamid, and then later on we'll have time uh, for some audience questions that I'll be pleased to bring into the conversation. Thank you so much, Anthony, for this. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I have had such a good time reading this book. Um, Hamid and I are old friends, although we don't get to see each other that much. Uh, so it was wonderful to have his voice and to also have his recollections of um, a great friend and a great man who was a common friend to us both. So, Hamid, I really, um, it's not so much questions, it's kind of inviting you to expand on things that you've written in the book. Um, and I must say, I mean, I, I don't know that I've read a book like this before. It is, it's your, it's, you put it that it's a record of your recollections of how you've read and responded to Saeed. So there are pieces here that are actually about Edward Said or written on occasions to do with Edward Said. And then there are pieces which are, as it were, your own work that is related to the work of, of Edward Said. And you know what it reminded me of? It reminded me of the um, tradition in old um, manuscripts coming out from the Islamic world, whether they were manuscripts of science or history or literature, where there is a work, and then there are, you know, great authors then put in marginalia on this work, commentary on this work, so that ultimately the, the, the manuscript itself is a record, not of the original author, but of the original author and responses and commentary and refutations of him. And I think that was one of the great traditions um, that, that, that we have. Um, I also, I'm I am going to invite you to speak, but I just want to say that the, it, the book is amazing because it is very analytical and very critical, and yet it has the strength of a polemic, um, moving from the grandeur of the mountain range to the disarmingly embracing character of Edward and, and so on. So, uh, so it's it's really, really a great read. So, I, I just want to invite you first, perhaps, to actually to actually talk about the the Edward Said bit of the book, as it were, because scattered through the book are your descriptions of him, which are so true, and yet perhaps that people are not so very aware of things like him not being a guru, but being an enabler. 
things like him not creating Saidians, but creating a path. Um, not at all dictating or predetermining what we say, but unleashing our tongues. And I thought perhaps you might like to actually just talk a bit about this um, somehow all embracing towering character that is also actually such a force for our own liberation. First and foremost, Ahdov, I must say how absolutely delighted and grateful and happy I am that you invite, accepted the invitation to uh, engage in conversation with me. I am a great fan of your work. Edward was a, was a discoverer in English, uh, comparative literary critical, your work. And your work uh, has been both in literary terms and in political terms. Your singular voice in making the Egyptian revolution understand, understandable around the globe and your path-breaking literary work that Edward lo loved and through Edward we came to know is uh, so crucial. And as a result for the launch of this book on Edward, I could not possibly dream of a better interlocutor to engage in conversation. As I was telling you before we went online, uh, uh, the image that I have when you visited Colombia on invitation of Edward, and then uh, I introduced Edward and Edward introduced you and then we, uh, we celebrated your work. And then uh, you, me, Edward and Mariam sat in the back of a cab and went to a restaurant. I mean, all of this now looks like a dream. So more than anything else, I want to make it uh, clear how delighted and, and as, as you British say, chuffed I am uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> that you, uh, you joined us for this uh, celebration. As for the uh, substance of the book, I think you, you put it best. The tradition of marginalia that you talk about, and we call it sharh, either sharh or hawashi, hashia, or the, and the concept is tahshia, uh, meaning we, we write on the marginalia of a text of a seminal thinker, and then the mar, there are hashia on hashia, and there are marginalia on the marginalia, and the thing goes on. It, it, this is very much uh, the idea. And uh, the book, uh, as uh, Anthony knows, began uh, when uh, a colleague and mutual friend of me and Edward was going to cite something that I had written on Edward, but had uh, read the Arabic translation of the article and thought the original was Arabic. I said, no, the original is in English. But the, the original was actually uh, in Al-Ahram when I uh, went for the first time to Palestine. And uh, I, uh, we, we reproduced that travelogue to Palestine in uh, uh, appeared in Al Ahram Weekly. Mona Anis, dear friend and my uh, editor at the time, published it. And Allah Yarhamu Yahani Shakrullah was the editor. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, then it occurred to me that uh, these articles need to be collected. So I began to. Uh, uh, Leila was my Leila Fad was my uh, assistant. He she began to collect all of my various articles that was on Edward or about Edward, simply to have a collection of them somewhere. And then when I began to read them, I began to relive the environment, the circumstances, and the ima uh, ima imaginary context of how these things were produced. So I began to write some notes about how these things came about. And of course, the inaugural piece is uh, this deeply emotional uh, piece that I wrote when Edward passed away. And uh, he passed away like three, four days after my younger brother passed away. So there was a conflation in my mind of Edward as a dear friend and colleague and comrade uh, who lived just a couple of buildings away from me, as you know, and also the loss of my own uh, uh, brother. Uh, but I, intend, I intentionally began the volume with something that I had wrote, written before Edward's passing, 2000, and he passed September 2003. So I began with a piece that I had written in 2001 on, on Clash of Civilization, in which Edward has this shadowy and imperceptive presence and uh, in my mind, in my thinking. Uh, then I go to the, to the rest of the piece. 
So the whole volume, as you rightly said, is a peculiar kind of autobiographical of my relationship, moral, political, literary, theoretical, philosophical relationship with the, with the monumental figure who I was fortunate to know personally. But then uh, eventually, in after, as I say in the book, after his passing, he actually has become more a presence in my mind than wow. he was uh, when I joined Columbia. Uh, when I joined Columbia, I, uh, I mean, I knew him, uh, but I was not enamored by Edward because my intellectual trajectory was of an entirely different uh, sort. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, wrote. I, I sent him a, the copy of my uh, my one of my books on Iranian revolution, and he wrote. I still have his handwriting. He wrote a handwritten note. We still were Professor Said and Professor Dabarshi, that sort of a thing, and that began uh, uh, culminated when we put together a Palestinian film festival in two thousand three. Uh, so there's a fusion, a kind of a zigzagging of my. Uh, thinking about his work, writing about his work, and his uh, courage, more than anything else, the, the passage that you just quoted, his courage, his conviction, his imagination, uh, unleashed, not just me, and a whole generations of uh, immigrant uh, uh, scholars and thinkers. Uh, as I say, say at some point, he always thought of himself as an exile. I no longer think of myself as an exile. I'm, I'm the father of four American children. How could I be in exile sitting next to my own children? So it's a different configuration of things. And uh, I, I continue to call myself Hamid, contrary to those who call themselves Henry or whatever it is that they, they, they call themselves. And uh, they, again, Edward, you know, when Edward talks about uh, his own sort of binary between Edward and Said. If you are Edward, then what is Said? If you are Said, what is Edward? Uh, he was so honest. He was so courageous. He was so in touch with the with the uh, with the uh, uh, the pulse of uh, of an entire generation of critical thinkers around the globe that were enabled by his voice. And I was fortunate to be uh, close to him and, and one of them. So the book has, uh, as you see from uh, both reading it and also those who have read it like you, is very personal and is very naked. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it's no pr pretension because it is impossible to be naked next to Edward intellectually, mm -hmm. uh, not naked. You have to be who you are and he makes you to be who you are. Uh, and then Anthony became, uh, interested in the book and the book came together and then when we put it together and Anthony sent me the the galleys to to read I realized we have a peculiar kind of a book mm -hmm. uh, that yes it is a book about Edward but it is also a book about an entire generation mm -hmm. of uh, immigrant third world intellectuals who are discovering a new kind of Gramscian organicity about who we are because it was Edward who took us to Gramsci, and in Gramsci he discovered the passage. Uh, you remember early in Orientalism, it says in, in, a, in a prison notebooks, uh, Gramsci says that every one of us have a hidden archive of who we are. Yeah. And then he added the Italian passage that Gramsci had, that the translator of Gramsci had not included. It is time for us to create that inventory. So oh. in a way, he enabled all of us to begin to enable our uh, inventory. And uh, the thing, uh, Ahdaf, uh, important, you, your, your forte is this extraordinary literary voice that you have discovered and you have, and in which you speak uh, so beautifully and comfortably and, and uh, imaginatively. Whereas for those of us who don't write creatively, we write critical work. It, it is a different trajectory to come to our own voice yeah. in, in the work of a scholarship and critical thinking. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to, um, before we move on from, from Edward, as a, I want to pick up one quality of his that, um, that you highlight and which doesn't, like, you know, 
I mean, obviously, it doesn't get mentioned that much, but, but which I think was really, really important to the effect that he had on, on the world. And you say, so many people ordinarily at political and ideological odds with each other, deeply loved Said without contradicting themselves or him. I think that's just so tremendously important now, I and mean, particularly now. Um, so I just, I just wanted to flag this. I mean, it is such a true... Yeah. <laughs> Listen, in, in some ways, Edward and I were politically very different creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, uh, he, as you know, he was a prince. He was born to a rich uh, a Palestinian family. He said, not with a silver, but with a gold spoon in his, in his mouth. And then he grew up in posh uh, uh, areas of, uh, of Egypt, uh, of Cairo. Uh, my dad was, uh, was a laborer and a complete devotee of uh, Yamal Abdel Nasser's socialism. And all his, uh, his my childhood memories of him was drinking uh, Smirnoff vodka, listening to Um Kulsum from Radio Baghdad, and singing the praise of uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is the uh, this is my my childhood, and then uh, I was drawn uh, politically to to Jibhe Shabiya and the Palestinian liberation very early in my life. Yeah. And as I and as I say in the book, I was not. Uh, draw, I was not drawn to Palestine because of Edward. I was drawn to Edward because of Palestine. Yes. Uh, but we were uh, politically different, and, and uh, that political difference also in, uh, speaks of intellectual differences and theoretical. So at some point, I began to sit down and say, "Okay, uh, he is a you know he is a, a prince of our cause. I'm not a prince. Uh, I'm a whole different uh, uh, disposition. Why is it that I am so drawn to him?" Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to tell you the story of the subtitle, uh, the, uh, you know, à la recherche de ton perdu, the, the, yeah, the, the Proustian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've told Anthony the story of this. Once I was leaving my office uh, to go towards the, the elevator and I was passing by Joseph Massad's uh, office and Joseph Massad, Joseph's uh, uh, door was open. And he saw me and he, he motioned to me, said, Edwards is on the phone, he wants to talk to you. So I, I went and picked up the phone and said, hi, Edward, what's happening, how are you? He said to me in a very serious voice, uh, have I done something? I said, what are you talking about? I said, have I offended you? He said, no, what are you talking about? So why don't you call me? I said, Edward, I just talked to you yesterday morning. We had an hour and a half discussion <laughs> talking about. And then I blurted out, I said, Edward, why do you bother? people who love you. He said, elementary Proust, my dear, elementary Proust. <laughs> so it is this, it is his yeah. sort of sideways of coming at you. Another yeah. wonderful memory. I was being attacked, like all of us being attacked, and I was pissed off, and I was on my way his, to, to my office, and I ran into him. And he said, why do you look so pissed off? I said, well, they, they're trying to intimidate you. He said, well, don't be intimidated. <laughs> yeah, you've got that in the book. That is, that is really yeah. great. <laughs> you yeah. know, he came from the left field, as we say. Yeah. And then it, from, coming from the uh, 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 left field, you never thought you were in an echo cham chamber with him. You yeah. always thought that he is discovering something in your own thoughts and highlighting it. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, that then you went back into the, the privacy of your own critical thinking and said, oh, well, I never noticed it. He mm -hmm. was this extraordinary listener and uh, a discoverer of aspects of your own thinking and then you came out and you became more of yourself. Or, or, that is, he enabled of being more your, yourself. So your point is absolutely correct that I see many of his admirers and those who have been influenced by him that I look at them and I'm not like them, but we are all indebted to him. Yeah. He was a touchstone. He was a philosopher's stone. He was something of a, of a peculiar nature that he enabled voices that uh, mm -hmm. we had, but we didn't know we have, or we didn't know the particular uh, echoes that this voice uh, can have. Yeah. So I, I yeah, yeah. I. I 
Okay, I, I want to sort of link from 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 Edward to something else. So I, I'm going to. I've got um, like I've written here. Hamid articulates beautifully the centrality of Palestine to Edward's thought, how it was the ground from which all his other interests flowered. So you make a beautiful, very elegant distinction, I think, between thinkers who care a bit about everything, Sartre, Foucault, Chomsky, and others whose diverse and varied work stems from one root cause, Fanon, Malcolm X, Guevara, Edward. It stems from one root cause, but then it goes on to embrace the whole, the whole world, really. Um, and obviously, I want to come back to Palestine. But on the sort of like bigger global, it, I don't know if it's bigger, but it's all related, but the global issue. Now, again, there is a wonderful sentence you have here, which I would really be personally very much interested in you expanding on, where you say, we are in the midst of massive subterranean changes in the material composition of the world, and the moral correspondence to it is yet to come. Exactly. The, again, you're a great reader, Ahdaf. You pick up things that uh, were uh, very important to me as I was writing them, but then, as you know, we tend to forget and move on. Uh, the comparison that I make uh, with the category of people like Sartre and uh, Foucault and, and so forth uh, has to do with the genealogy of their intellect. As European intellectuals, they were open-minded and and uh, caring and competent and liberal-minded. So if uh, Fanon comes and says, well, I have written this book, and Sach says, yes, I write an introduction to it, so the book becomes uh, a, a canon, part of the canon. Uh, this, uh, again, <laughs> I, I cite my late professor, Philip Reef. He had something called Monroe Doctrine, not the famous uh, President Monroe, but Marilyn Monroe doctrine, because Marilyn yeah. Monroe has said, I believe in everything, a little bit. Yeah. So they all believe in everything, but yeah, a little bit. Mm. Uh, Edward transformed that, radically transformed it. And uh, of course, Edward cared about everything. I mean, the reason that he's so important in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, is precisely because his, uh, his, his love and care and attention to all of these areas. But the origin of it, going back to your point about Palestine, is Palestine, is universalization of the Palestinian cause. But universalization not in a kind of a wishy-washy, uh, goody-two-shoes way, in a principle, uh, his seminal work, The Question of Palestine, picks up from Karl Marx and extends it into our contemporary realities in a way that nobody can care about any serious cause in Egypt, in Iran, in Latin America, in Africa, without simultaneously caring about Palestine. So yeah. Palestine becomes a touchstone, becomes an uh, acid yeah. test. And that is because of Edwards, uh, Edwards' work, the way that he pulled uh, uh, Palestinian cause out of its sectarian uh, Arab nationalist and uh, third world socialist, all of these uh, uh, forces, and turned it theoretically and philosophically and politically into the touchstone of our political position. This is his seminal uh, achievement. And as a result, uh, there is there are larger philosophical implication to this because it is exactly against euro universalization that is if uh, if uh, uh, I, I, I say it uh, you know in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in my book on the can non Europeans think if if Mozart sneezes and I'm sure he has sneezed beautifully that's music. But the most sophisticated mus mus musicological constructions in India or in the Arab world are yeah. ethno music. Uh, ethno music. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wonder what the hell is this ethno thing magic? So for them is ethos and logos, for us is it ethnos. This is the radical achievement of Edward. That is, he turned the ethnos upside down. And he liberated the ability of an Arab and an Iranian and a, 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 through a, being a Palestinian uh, 
into uh, universalization that is reclaiming the world from that perspective rather than anything that we say. Uh, this is what I said before that is, you, oh, you write English with an Arabic accent. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Who writes English without an accent? Mm. Yeah. Every, everybody yeah. writes in English with an accent. An Egyptian accent or French accent or, or, or whatever accent. I, I have a funny story. I always tell I was in Arizona for a talk and we were put into this bed and breakfast situations. And then we had a communal breakfast with other people in the, in the inn. And this very nice uh, Southern lady turned to me at breakfast and she said, and where do you come from? I said, I come from New York, man. And she said, but I do detect a little bit of accent. I say, here, I also detect a little bit of accent, but you don't hear your own little bit of accent. You hear my little bit. So we all talk with an accent. But the, the question is to make that accent conscious and, and begin to, again, through Edward, through Gramsci, to make it the basis mm. of a different world that has been hidden yeah. and yet rediscovered. So yes, the, 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 uh, his way of writing about uh, I mean, to think, of course, we have to acknowledge that Iqbal Ahmad, uh, Allah Yerhamu, had a tremendous impact, as as you well know, was dear but friend Edward, of... Edward, Edward, you know, never tired of saying that. Exactly, he was a dear friend of, uh, and had a tremendous impact in... Uh, he and Ibrahim Abu Lughod, yeah. uh, Ibrahim Abu Lughod and Iqbal Ahmad, uh, Ibrahim Abu Lughod, the father of our distinguished colleague, uh, Leila Abu Lughod, they had tremendous impact on Edwards' politicization and uh, and uh, ability to reconnect to Palestine. So we need to have a genealogy. I think somewhere in the in the book I, I talk, we need, need to have the genealogy of how did Edward became Edward, and then how he made Palestine the epicenter of our critical thinking, not just in with, uh, via political solidarity, but via theoretical and philosophical. Uh, uh, rethinking of what is the world, where is the world? Yeah, well, I mean, again, you you say that his virtue was to turn the vices of his time into momentous occasions for a more universal good that went beyond the specificity of one wrong or another, which of course is the issue that, you know, is periodically fought over um, about sort of you know, mentioning the Holocaust and the never again, is it never again for one lot of people or is it never again for the whole world? So this sort of like, you know, the taking of a specific huge wrong and extrapolating from it into, into a universal um, position. But you also speak a lot, now this is to, to talk about your thoughts, about you uh, sort of urge that the time now is, this is speaking of the Palestinian issue, but I think we could actually broaden it out, um, that it is past the time for lamenting and citing wrongs, and that really the duty and the useful thing to do now is to imagine the outcome, to imagine the world that we want to create and that we want to inhabit. And I think um, to go back to the, your words that I just quoted at you, uh, changes in the material composition of the world and the moral correspondence to it is yet to come. Aren't these two ideas linked that, that basically there is, I won't say, it's, it's not, I mean, it's not a failure and if it's a failure then I too am part of it, that the idea of what what is it, we know what's wrong, well, what would be right, and imagining that. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, if you look at the book, the representation of the intellectuals, and the yeah. way that he brings together two characters, one historical, one fictional, Bozorov from Turgenev, mm. and, uh, and uh, Adorno, the, the, the man that he loved and admired and was central to his, uh, to his critical thinking. 
that uh, in, a, in a way universalized the horror of Holocaust by looking at the consequent intellectual philosophical consequences of, uh, of Holocaust in a lot much larger universal terms that uh, to me, not so paradoxically, in fact, entirely legitimately, Edward Said was perhaps among the very few people who could thus universalize uh, Holocaust and uh, uh, begin to wed it to the, to the causes of liberation and justice and, and truth uh, uh, in any context. You remember towards somewhere in the middle of the, uh, one of the epilogues that he wrote to Orientalism, when he, he is more, uh, he's gentler and kinder to his uh, critics, he, he says, uh, some of my uh, critics keep talking about theoretical inconsistencies between my humanism and my, my uh, critical stance. Uh, it, it is what it is. Orientalism is not a theoretical machinery. It's a work of advocacy. It is such a brilliant moment that he is not trapped within yeah. theoretical consistency, but he looks, he has his gaze on truth. Yeah. And justice. I mean, these words in this time and age of alternative facts and post truths and Trumpism or Obamaism, for that matter, uh, are strange to articulate. But it is it is a fact that he could, and it is in the first posthumous book that uh, Akil Bergrami, our colleagues, uh, a philosophy department, published on uh, literary humanism, that he comes to an expansion of uh, the humanism that he knew and he had in inherited into a larger frame of comparative humanism, literary humanism, that uh, enabled a particular theoretical voice that mm -hmm. could correspond to those changing material conditions that you, uh, that you mentioned. I mean, he, you know, uh, tongue in cheek, he called himself the last Jewish intellectual. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, which is in in the context of New York is crucial, mm -hmm. uh, but also his love and admiration for uh, African American intellectuals because these yeah. are the two categories: yeah. James Baldwin and Adorno, uh, as it yeah. were. That yeah. Edward placed himself somewhere between James Baldwin in uh, in Harlem and Adorno in in uh, you know central part of Manhattan. Or, or uh, Hannah Arendt for that. I mean, for me, it's Hannah Arendt, but for he, for Edward was uh, was uh, Adorno. This is what I mean by creating a new uh, organicity, a new kind of intellectual organicity that is globally rooted, is globally rooted by being precisely committed to one particular cause, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, Black Lives Matter here in the United States or uh, the cause of justice and, and uh, democracy in, in Egypt, or uh, anything else anywhere else. That is, once you put all of them together, if you look at the solidarity that has emerged between the Palestinian uh, uh, cause and the African-American uh, cause, this is the condition right now. How, what is the acid test? The acid test of not falling into the trap of Obama is God's gift to humanity, whereas Obama has actually derailed the uh, moral, intellectual, and political trajectory that began with Malcolm X, is to go back to Malcolm X and James Baldwin and uh, W.E. Du Bois, etc. And when you go that, then you see Palestine is already evident there. Yeah. By virtue of, of, of Edward's work, the condition in which a new organicity has emerged, in which you can no longer be uh, pathetically provincial as American liberals have been. All of these people who are not champions of against uh, Trump, they were all pro-war, pro-Iraq war, pro-Afghan pro war, uh, and, and all of that. Absolutely. Uh, and we are in a position to make that judgment precisely because of Edward's work. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, going uh, off tangent from my book because the book is really, uh, I so love it. Thank you, Anthony. It's so adorable to look at it. The book is really a living, a living text yeah. of, uh, of one among myriad, among thousands of Edward's uh, uh, students, colleagues, comrades, 
that uh, especially since he's no longer with us, his living memory uh, continues to be uh, present that uh, sometimes I get up in the morning and, you know, this morning I was writing something about, I don't know, one thing or another, that I, I fear, I always think he's looking over my shoulder and thinking, well, so what do you say? What, what do you think? So in a way, we continue to have our conversation with Edward, but in, in a conversation that always he enabled, namely, he made us speak more coherently. Well, it's so, it's so, um, the passage where you visit um, his grave and you sprinkle some of the soil that you took with you from Palestine over his grave, it's, um, it's incredibly touching. And I think, I mean, you know, apart from that, I think he would have loved this book anyway. Um, and yeah, so, uh, so he'd be happy looking over your shoulder. You, you know, the, the, I did it as, as, a, as a Muslim, you know, yeah. Uh, the, when he passed away, there were issues whether he should be buried in Palestine or in uh, Ramallah, as Maryam, uh, he had asked, he told Maryam. Uh, so I, uh, it, in my own mind, I, 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 I thought if Muhammad doesn't go to mountain, mountain goes to Muhammad. So yeah. if he is not taken to, to Jerusalem, yeah, I, take Jerusalem I take Jerusalem to him. So... Yeah. We were in Jerusalem for our Palestinian Film Festival, and I went to near Babel Osud in uh, in Haram Sharif. There is a there is a, a small cemetery of the of the Sahaba of the Prophet. Yeah. Uh, and I took a, a a fistful of dust and I put it in my pocket, brought it to New York for his memorial, then went to Beirut, went to Bromana, and put it on his grave. Say, so, okay, you're Muhammad. You're not an I mean, figuratively speaking. Uh, <laughs> You didn't go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is coming. Yeah. yeah, no, that 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 was beautiful. So while we are um, on Palestine, now you describe an early meeting at uh, Mahmoud Mamdani's apartment to try to persuade Colombia to divest from companies that sold arms to Israel, and it seems a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, but of course, it was defeated in the Senate and in the president's office. Now. We know also that for the last, I don't know how many years, the student body at Columbia has been voting to divest from Israel. And it's sort of, you know, that, that democratic decision has gone so far and no further. It's been killed and uh, so on. So what, I mean, you know, what, has anything changed? Is there, I mean, one feels, of course, that there is change, that there is change at sort of ground level in sort of the embrace of a lot of people across the world for uh, BDS and how it used to be impossible to speak about Palestine. And now you actually, I actually find myself assuming, if I'm speaking to a new person, assuming that they are on the same side, as it were, and believe in justice for Palestine. That didn't used to be the case. But but the the powers that be, whether it's presidents of universities or um, you know I don't know arms companies, uh, congresses, and so on, are very very resistant to to change. What how do you read this? Oh, I think that there has been a sea change. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, in my own lifetime as a as a faculty member, I remember very vividly on our campus uh, anytime. To, say, to go to Palestine, whispered. Oh, he's from Palestine. Yeah. Palestine was whispered. But yeah. now go and look as as Shaza Dalal, uh, uh, Ahmad Dalal's daughter. I've known since she, she, when she graduated from uh, from Barnard. Just just go and watch her her speech. Yeah. It's a whole different ball game. Uh, you know, uh, the BDS is now a major global movement, has a massive presence here in the United States. And the reason that people like Pompeo and others are barking against uh, BDS, it is precisely because on, on, the, on the floor of the Democratic uh, Party, this corrupt Democratic Party, the rank and file of the Democratic Party is solidly uh, pro Palestinian, but the leadership of uh, of the Democratic Party doesn't allow it. But yeah. the reason that you see that there are now legislations against even having sympathy for the BDS is precisely because of the power of the BD BDS. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but at the the incident to which you report, it was a, a, 
very uh, early period. We were not, BDS was not uh, yet what it was, what, what it has become. We were simply asking and we collected, you know, a few signatures and then we were resoundingly defeated. Uh, but uh, for asking Co Colombia to divest from companies uh, uh, that sell military or military uh, like equi equipment to Israel, but we were defeated. Yeah. But th that defeat was, uh, uh, it's, uh, it was a paradoxical defeat. The list of the signatories, you will laugh, the list of the signatories, which was, I don't know, a few dozen people, mostly from social sciences and humanities, became the core curriculum of Colombia. People thought, okay. if you go to Colombia, you don't want to miss this. Yeah, these are the people you have to go with. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, it is like that ghastly book, uh, 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 professors, whatever, that this uh, horrid uh, man wrote. Uh, in which he listed 101 most dangerous professors. And right. that book became, uh, I, I was in, with my publisher in London and I saw the book was on the, his table. I said, what are you doing with this? We said, well, I want to know which one of you we haven't published yet. <laughs> Anthony is laughing because he's having the same book and, and publishing it goes down the list. So going back to your, to your point, Adolf, that I am, I mean, I cannot afford not to be optimist. Of course, uh, exactly. I am very optimistic. Yeah. There are serious changes that are glorious aspects of the Black Lives Matter or Women March, of uh, and also the catalytic effect that this has had on the Palestinian uprising. If you look at the yeah. uh, the Earth Day uh, movement in Gaza and the yeah. the conscious and the uh, uh, eloquence of African American uh, uh, iconic figures like Angela Davis uh, and, and others who have spoken so eloquently and convincingly. It's a whole different generation. But these are seismic changes that are happening on the ground or underground. And the way that you measure them to see how people in position of power tr try to repress it and, and silence it. But it, doesn't, it, it does not get It actually becomes more eloquent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, the other bugbear, of course, uh, in the West, from you know, besides Palestine, is Islam. No, um, and the whole the whole Muslim terrorist uh, trope. And um, you, interestingly, I mean, you talk, of course, about uh, you know the the scholarship that went into the studying Islam, um, and you're quite generous to begin with about, you know, oriental study of Islam and how they wanted to understand it. And I was marking it furiously. Um, <laughs> they only wanted to understand it so that they could, you know, sort of uh, speak against it and, 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 uh, and so on. And of course, except that they lost a few people along the way, the people who really studied and understood and then thought, hey, you know, this isn't such a bad thing after all. But then, of course, you, you, you then bring in Bernard Lewis and um, and interestingly, I, I was thinking that Edward once said to me, uh, I can't remember whether it was about Daniel Pipes or Richard Pipes. He said, well, isn't how extraordinary that someone should spend their whole life studying something that they hate. Exactly. You know, about the one of them who was studying Russia, the father. Exactly. Uh, and, and then later on in the book, after I'd had that thought, you actually say this about Bernard Lewis. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, it is a sign. I mean, when the Arab revolutions uh, happened, that was that's an incredible quote. I got so and I hadn't seen it. I only saw it in your <laughs> book, and I thought, you, you know, you know, a, a massive, massive. I I don't need to tell you. You and your your family and your friends have been at the epicenter of it. Massive democratic uprising happens from corner to corner of the Arab world. And we are happy, we are excited. And when I wrote my book on uh, Arab Spring, uh, the people were telling me, oh, uh, isn't it too soon? I said, what are you talking about? I can't be in Tahrir Square to, to scream, Ashab, you read the Salat and Nizam. This book is my Ashab, you read the Salat and Nizam. Yeah. I don't care if I'm proven, I mean, knock the wood, a decade later, there's nothing in that book that I will take back. But we were all excited about this 
amazing decentering yeah. of world politics yeah. with Tahrir uh, Square as the epicenter of our new global imagination. And then Bernard Lewis said, oh, yes, in the Arab world, they can't have sex. So uh, this is, uh, if you have more bordello houses, there will be less revolution. I mean, this is, this is the, the pathetic banality. I mean, people think, where, t where did Trump come from? Did, did Trump didn't come from the sky. Trump yeah. is the product of all of these creatures that were invited to uh, White House and Pentagon and Mabar Shu talking about, uh, yeah. uh, about this. So uh, the, uh, going back to, to Islam, as you know... It's such a shame that we need to care about them, you know, that we couldn't just think of them as a few mad people on the periphery of the world, but that we actually have to take note of Adolf, how think. Why would, let, let's put it very bluntly, why would an Egyptian uh, writer, critical thinker, intellectual, journalist, give a hoot about election in the United States. Because Except, they have the arms and the money and they pop exactly. off the system because, here. Because it us. is not that because it is big or powerful, because it is dangerous. Absolutely. It is a, it, 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 I wrote the other day, American democracy that can result in, in Donald Trump and then after four years of Donald Trump, Joe Biden appears as God's gift to humanity, is an existential threat to world peace. This is what we, we are uh, dealing with. So parado uh, I, was, uh, with, uh, I was in Geneva in a conference about Orientalism recently uh, with Adam Schatz. Uh, with, uh, and then I told, you know, uh, Orientalism is over. We don't have Orientalism because Orientalism was when the Orientalists were trying to figure out what is Islam. Yeah. But now Mike Pompeo knows what is Islam. Yeah. Islam is a disease. Islam is a cancer. Finish. Halas. That's the end of uh, Orientalism. Because yeah. then they were trying to manufacture a knowledge that facilitates their ruling over Muslim countries. But That's now right. they don't need that. Mohammed bin Salman is helping them. Mohammed Salman is just, just come here and... And the rulers of Bahrain and rulers of the United Arab Emirates, they say yeah. they're, uh, they're house Muslims, as it, as it were. Shmunken. Shmunken. <laughs> yeah, it's, but it's true. It's incredible. I mean, they just, they just, they, 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 the Emiratis just signed a deal, I mean, an Emirati, buying a major share in the most, the most extremist, fanatic, Arab hating of the Israeli football teams. And he, you know, why, why this one? You know, you could have chosen a team that had a couple of Palestinian players, for example. No, no, no. Went for the worst one. So, oh, yeah. Uh, to me, this is, again, going back to Edward, to me, this is a liberating uh, moment yeah. that the false assumptions of yeah. the Arab world or Arab nation or... Uh, any of that has been exposed to be a, a sham. Palestinians rediscover the truth and reality of a solidarity of masses of millions of people in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in North America, in Canada, in United States, irrespective of their white or black or blue or uh, anything else, that it is the moral, that is what has emerged is moral position not for your name being uh, Mohammed bin Salman or Mohammed bin Zaid or uh, uh, whatever. Sure. That means nothing, yeah? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm wondering if, uh, is there, uh, do we have an audience? Are there people who want to come in? Are we hogging the, the platform here? Am I hogging the platform? We do I have uh, uh, audience yeah. questions, uh, although everyone uh, is, Loving the conversation, uh, but I can bring in a few. Um, maybe I'll ask two together. Um, uh, I think they kind of make an interesting pairing. Uh, the first is from Nasheen Hussein, who asks, uh, there are many areas now that are ground zeros of state oppression, Kashmir particularly. Are there Saeed-esque thinkers we should pay attention to? Uh, that's one. And then... Phil Stenstrom uh, asks, I wondered if the speakers might outline some of Edward Said's key ideas for those of us who are less familiar with them. I'd love to hear how they are showing up today. 
I mean, uh, uh, Ahdaf can do either of uh, I those. Think you can do both. This is. Uh, this <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, the, the question from Kashmir, is absolutely crucial no, that there are uh, uh, epicenters in Syria, in Palestine, in Iraq, in uh, Iran, in uh, Pakistan, but particularly in, uh, in this case, in Kashmir, that uh, should be the epicenter of our critical thinking because they are subject to harassment and Hindu nationalism or Islamist uh, negligence or uh, 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 over politicization. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, as to who is uh, uh, Saeed Yask, I don't, again, Saeed Yask, I don't know what exactly that means, but there is a wonderful newspaper that is published in Malayalam in, uh, in southern India that is uh, wonderful in terms of uh, uh, following the events from a very critical perspective. I know them because they have been kind and translating some of my works. I have a readership in southern India, in Kerala. Uh, so I will defer to actually uh, critical thinkers in the region, in the country, in itself, rather than looking for a name uh, outside the region. Uh, as for Edward's uh, key ideas, uh, uh, as Adolf knows uh, uh, infinitely better, initially Edward was really a monumental literary figure and a uh, literary theorist. And his book on the uh, critique, the world and the, and the text is the culmination of his constellation of ideas such as traveling theory, such as worldliness, such as contrapuntal thinking that appear in, uh, in that book. But subsequently, his, of course, seminal work is Orientalism, in which he uh, extends Gramscian and Foucauldian ideas of relations between knowledge and power, but uh, uh, laser beams on the specificity of the Arab uh, Orientalism and makes it uh, uh, universally legitimate. After that book, Cultural Imperialism becomes his second seminal work that expands the ideas in Orientalism, the, the two of them. The next two books that I will mention is Covering Islam, apropos the point that Ahdav was just making in terms of how uh, American and European journalism is uh, responsible, is the is the a culprit in manufacturing a conception of uh, demonized Islam to, from which we are yet to emerge. And then representation of intellectuals. These five books that I just mentioned are the, you know, the pillars of Edwards' uh, critical thinking. And then the, his first posthumous book that was published on literary humanism uh, is, uh, are the, the, the things to be noted. Um, I, I'd like to come back, thank you, but I'd like to come back to Nusheen actually, Nusheen Hussain. Um, if you're looking for specific suggestions as to uh, where to read, um, you know, sort of uh, good good stuff on, uh, on Kashmir and similar, I would say that um, the Indian Cultural Forum, if you, if you go to their uh, uh, website, the Indian Cultural Forum, they link to a lot of things that are well worth reading. Um, the articles of Muhammad Hanif are also, um, I'm not talking about the novels, I'm talking about his articles, Muhammad Hanif. And also, I think if you follow Salil Tripathi, S-A-L-I-L -L, Tripathi, if you follow him on Twitter, again, he links to things that are well worth reading um, in and about the region. So that might be useful. Could you also both perhaps include other regions that are that you particularly pay attention to, Iran, Egypt, you know, other people we might be reading and uh, sharing their work right in this moment? Uh, I, if I can pitch my dear buddy, uh, Pankaj Mishra. Um, right now I'm reading Pankaj Mishra's and uh, first of all, I love I, uh, his dear friend. I admire his work, but I also admire his, his, uh, his uh, patience that he can sit down and read an entire tome by Salman Rushdie. Uh, I can't read him uh, anymore. 
uh, and then come up with uh, cogent arguments uh, about what he's, he's talking about. But this new book of Age of uh, Anger by Pankaj Mishra, and also a recent essay that he wrote a couple of years ago for, uh, again, a London Review of Books or TLS, I conf always conf conflate these two, uh, is, uh, is a thinker, again, to my liking, that brings together various uh, areas of the world into the uh, 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 formation of a critical judgment that you will understand whether it is the rise of the right, whether it is the rise of uh, uh, new liberalism. Uh, and then there are, to, uh, to me, there are some seminal figures like Walter Mignolo, my own uh, buddy here in the US, that his observations about Latin America uh, are critical uh, uh, to follow, yeah. No, I, I'm not going to suggest uh, uh, books. I think Hamid has done that best. I, I would suggest to people who are interested that they should follow the Progressive International. This is a, 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 a body of people, and I'm very proud to be on its council, um, that has formed recently with basically the idea of becoming a hub for progressive uh, liberationist uh, movements, organizations, individuals across the world. The, the sort of basic idea being that, um, that neoliberal capital and states and arms dealers um, and lawmakers and financiers across the world all work together, whereas uh, progressives are fragmented. And I think any one of us who's had experience of political action or attempts at polit political action uh, sees very quickly how the left is, is just so good at fragmenting. So this is an attempt to, to actually create enough of a flexible and international and egalitarian platform to, to provide some kind of platform or hub for people to come together and share ideas and share actions. Their, their sort of newest action, which started about a week ago, is uh, to make Amazon pay, for example. And that started to be, um, to you know, and to actually attract a lot of attention and so on. So I've, I, I have a lot of hope for that. And I would urge people to look up their website, Progressive International, and to look up their our uh, manifesto and points points of agreement, and you know if they like what they see, then uh, join, be a member. Could you also Adaf talk a bit about Palfest and uh, its history, any connection it may have um, to Edward, and then the future in this moment where you know travel is is so difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, Palfest is is a festival that I and some and my son and some friends started, and it began. Uh, our the first edition was in two thousand and eight, and it was it was very much born. My first my first uh, visit to Palestine was in two thousand, and that was for the Guardian at the end of two thousand. It was to report on the uh, second Intifada, and I went there very very much under the protection and the mentorship of Edward, who gave me a list of people um, that I should contact and their phone numbers and you know talk to them ahead of my visit and basically just provided the, the architecture um, for, for my visit. Because of course it was also very difficult because um, as an Egyptian, since the Camp David Accords, uh, everyone, everyone that I, care about and value in Egypt was practicing boycott. And uh, so it was it was somewhat problematic to maneuver through this, to say, well, I'm going, but I'm going just for the Palestinians, etc. Et so it was under Edward's protection that I did that. And it was out of that visit and another one in 2003 that the idea was, was born. Um, and the idea then was to take uh, Western uh, writers, artists, cultural sort of movers to take them to Palestine to to uh, perform a week long literary festival. We never said come and find out what it's like. We said 
you do readings, you do seminars, you do workshops, come and do these in Palestine. And the only commitment we ask is that you travel with us for a week. And we chose people actually who were not on board with the Palestinian cause, people who would say that Israel was the only democracy in the Middle East, or that um, uh, yeah, the occupation's wrong, but the Arabs should give up violence, that kind of thing. And uh, the it was a traveling festival. So we, we moved them every day, because again, when I had been there, I had realized like how difficult, unpleasant it was, and you know, Hamid, mean, you've spoken about that beautifully in, in the book, for people to cross checkpoints. And Maybe so we, the festival will cross the checkpoints and we'll go to a different city each day. In one way, of course, that gives our visitors the chance to experience a checkpoint, to experience Palestinian life. And also it means that our Palestinian audiences can come to us without, without having to go through checkpoints. So, um, so we did that. We did a festival a year for 10 years and, um, and we had some wonderful writers and artists with us and we, you know, had wonderful Palestinian friends and comrades who, uh, worked with us. I mean, we, we really were only helping the Palestinians do what they do. We were only amplifying Palestinian voices and making the Palestinian experience available to, um, to Western artists. So uh, we, we, you know, we did that for 10 years and we, I mean, people were very, very moved and people signed on to BGS without being asked and, and so on. And there was Oh, I'm afraid we, we lost Adaf temporarily. I'm sure she'll be back, but while she's we're she's waiting back, for her. Oh, sorry, you're back, Adaf. Yeah. Please continue. Um, so, I, as I said, a wonderful community of Palfa civilians was created. And, and then um, we had a year's break to, to think about what we were doing because the world had changed. Um, there were other festivals happening. There was virtual stuff happening. And basically, the information that we were providing to the world was available at the press of a button on the internet. So uh, then under the influence of the younger people, my son particularly in the festival, there was a change of, um, of mission. And the idea became that the festival would take uh, people, academics, thinkers, um, artists who were working at the cutting edge of a particular aspect of uh, the world that was being formed. So say, for example, um, urbanization, or say the use of water. Oh, I'm afraid we've lost Adaf again. Um, hopefully she'll be back in a moment. Um, and while we're waiting for her, uh, Hamid. Uh, uh, I just want to add, I propose the, pa the Palestinian festival that uh, uh, Ahdaf was talking about. Uh, in that context, I just want to pitch this exquisite book of Susan Abul Hawa, Against Loveless uh, World, uh, that I'm reading right now. Uh, there are things emerging from the Palestinian literary uh, environment in English. Uh, I mean, Arabic is a whole different uh, uh, ball game that uh, people should pay attention to, that this festival is not just in name or for political purposes. There are there are palpable literary consequences. But uh, before we get Ahdaf back, so I, he, she's not embarrassed, her own book on Cairo, My City, Our Revolution, is, is just a gem, absolute gem. Do and we can put a link in the chat to yeah. where people can get that book. I also am remiss, I should have also earlier uh, acknowledged and thanked Tess, who's been providing live captioning for our event. We're really grateful for that. Um, those, uh, there's instructions in the chat about how to follow the live captioning. Um, maybe uh, this might be a final question, uh, Hamid, because um, partly because unfortunately, I think the authorities in Cairo may have caught wind of, uh, of this conversation. <laughs> um, but uh, we have a question from Sean. Um, you both talked about the importance of partisanship to Saeed's work and his whole approach. 
Can you talk about how your own political partisanship has played a role in your work? What have you taken from Saeed in this regard? Uh, first, I hope we can get uh, Ahtaf back to say proper goodbye. I uh, was very happy and uh, grateful that she could join us from Cairo. Uh, part, the thing that we call Anthony and Sean uh, partisanship, I really don't know because I cannot separate politics and moral morality uh, and theoretical uh, speculations. To, to me, they're all related. Uh, I get up in the morning and I start writing my column for Al Jazeera. Uh, I'm not thinking, okay, now this is my political, uh, and then a couple of hours later, I, I turn to my uh, theoretical work. They're all related. That is my political position, is my moral position, and my moral position appears in my theoretical uh, work and literary work and whatever else uh, I do. In fact, is a peculiar aspect of uh, North American politics that we think political is uh, is something separate from the rest of our moral and imaginative uh, world. Uh, it is not. I mean, when I wrote my recent piece, Why I Will Not Vote for uh, for Joe Biden, it, it comes from the depth of my own political positions and also theoretical position and moral position. Simple as that. Uh, and I, I dare say, again, people have to read Edwards, for example, uh, extraordinary book on representation of intellectuals and uh, the, the centrality of the figure of naysayer. He makes a crucial distinction between eyesayers and naysayers. As a naysayer. Uh, so, you know, again, paraphrasing him or extending his argument, I say, and then not being like him because he, he thought he was in exile. I don't think I'm exiled. If I, the thing is, Anthony, if I get up in the New York and think I'm in exile, finish. That's the end of my moral and political commitment to my city and my people and, you know, uh, what it is that we all do, beginning with my own children. So uh, that then you're not in exile, you're at home. Home, let's finish with this. Home is where you hang your hat and say no to power. Well, that is a very fitting end. Uh, we're so grateful to Adaf uh, and we're sorry that she can't be with us for the full length of the conversation, but really, uh, you know, couldn't think of a better way to launch this beautiful book into the world. We're so grateful. My, my, my gratitude to you, Anthony, and Great. your team in Haymarket, and to Rory and Sean and everybody else for facilitating this. I will write to uh, Ahdaf separately to thank her for making time for this. This has been uh, quite, a, a, quite a feat. Thanks for arranging it. Thanks, everyone. And please get, get your copy of the book.